The average internet user worldwide spends between two and three hours a day connected on and off on social media and its persuasive technology. So let's talk about that. Let's see how is your relationship with social media or with any artificial algorithm that makes recommendations. And we don't have to go to the newest and the latest jet GPT, jet bot and, and whatever is out there, right? Just when you go shopping or when you're consuming or in entertainment or when you want to connect with others, that is usually mediated by an artificial intelligence. Are you worried about your relationship with social media and with these algorithms? What about children's relationship with this technology? Growing up with it, are you worried about that? Do you sometimes feel listened to? Are you sometimes surprised how much these intelligence algorithms know about you? Well, we are certainly aware of the benefits of the technology, but what exactly, what exactly are the downsides? Can you formulate that? And how can social media companies be the most valuable companies in the history of humankind or among them, and, and they don't even charge for their product? What, how do they create their value? Most of these answers have to do with something that is known as persuasive technology, technology that persuades you of something, that brainwashes you. Throughout most of the digital paradigm, we have not been focusing on the downsides. We have actually been focusing on the upsides. And if we have been focusing on, on the downsides, we have been focusing on when the technologies would overcome the best of us, right? So there was the machine intelligence, and then this moment has a technical term. It's called the technological singularity, when general artificial intelligence would, would be best th than the best of us. And we have been playing this game for a long time, focusing on like, what is the human strength? A game you can call only a human can. And we had a lot of these only a human can and we tucked them against the wall and then they were dragged down. In, in a previous lecture, we already talked about that only a human supposedly can play chess. Well, that was several decades ago that, well, Kasparov, the best of us at that time, lost against the machine in the late 90s. And then we said, well, okay, but only a human can play Go, which is much more complex than chess. You cannot solve it with brute force. You need intuition, creativity. There's like this human gut feeling. And we talked about it in a previous lecture as well. Well, 2016, that fell down too. Uh, and then we said, okay, so, but what about this? So, so chess and go, these are like quantitative games. What about this qualitative thing? Like a, a, a machine could never like recognize and or interpret an, an image that's very qualitative. Well, that also fell down. And then we said, okay, so, but what, okay, what is about the human speech? Uh, the voice of a mother. That is like a machine cannot be better than a human to recognize the voice. Okay, so that also, and there's, okay, so what about faces? You know, the face of the grandmother, the, the face of like from your, like you can, well, in two thousand that also fell down. And so we've been playing that game and then, you know, generative AI came along and then they surpassed us in AP English essays. That was 2022. And uh, then we was like, okay, maybe we should stop that game with the, only the human can. And now we are focusing on that the newest AI is better than the previous AI. And now we play this game of AI against, I mean, all right. So, so we love playing this game of when things become, become better than us and, and better than the best of us. And while we have been playing this game, we completely ignored that in order to dominate us, the machines don't have to be better than the best of us. They just have to be better than the worst of us. And while we didn't pay attention, that seems to have happened. They have been starting to dominate us, not in our strength, but in our weaknesses and our well, 
negative emotions, in the downsides that we have, in our anxiety, in our anger, in our outrage, in our addictive behavior for trying to get, whatever, we'll talk a lot about these. And you know, just to give you one example, we don't have to now be very academic about it, just think about yourself recently. You know, like recently when you wanted to go to bed early, because you really had this very important day the next day and you really needed a good night of sleep. That was very important. But just before you went to bed, you just wanted to check this, this one social media post or this one video. You just wanted to watch like, but only one, this time only one. And then two hours later, you emerged from this digital black hole and you thought about like, what, what, what happened right now? You know what happened right now? A supercomputer was pointed at your brain. A supercomputer that knows you better then you know yourself, and we will talk about uh, that today. Your little brain, your little brain basically didn't, didn't have a chance. It knew exactly where to take you to make you act against your will. You wanted to sleep, right? And actually, there is a judicial term for that that always comes to my mind when I think about that. It's called volitional impairment. That is used legal lingo that kind of like excuses. But there are some people we classify that they have volitional impairment. That's defined as the impulsive behavior resulting from impairment affecting the ability to choose to engage in behavior, or inhibit such behavior, that is not consistent with the self-interest of the individual. Now, that is a severe condition. We say like, oh, people who have volitional impairment, like don't, like we have to really either protect them or they're not responsible for it. And what happened to our volition, to our will, if the machine can make us do things against our will? You know, I was recently working for the United Nations Development Report and we wrote this report on the Anthropocene, the, the, the Anthropocene where, where the human is in the center of development is defined as an age of human choice. Well, do we still live in the Anthropocene? Do we still live in an age defined by human choice? Well, last time when I lost my night of sleep because of, you know, that's an interesting question. So, and it comes back to that, <clears throat> if it's human choice that's in charge, then, okay, let's socially construct a technology. And in the first lecture of this, of this specialization, we talked about this technological determinism versus social constructivism, where we said, well, the technology is not inherently good or bad. A technology um, just is what it is. And you can use it for the good or the bad, same as the hammer. You want to distinguish yourself, distinguish yourself from the rest of the animals. You need something akin to a hammer to build yourself a shelter in order to protect you from the elements. But as soon as you become an, a hobo, homo habilis, an early human that has, like, you can also use it to do a lot of damage with that. Now, that's not the, the fault of the hammer. So modern technology is just like that, including artificial intelligence and, and all the other things that we're going to talk with, the blockchain and the metaverse and all these cool new things. Kind of like think about the hammer. It's much easier to think about that. And, you know, this is a, a graph that I used for, for a long time. It's, it's, it's a very old graph. And you ask people if technology makes the world a better or worse place, you always get a, a split outline because some people get the burned end and it's not the technology's fault. Also, recently, there were some, some documents released by, by internal research by social media companies like Facebook. And for example, this graph, Facebook detected itself that Instagram, one of its platform, uh, that one in five teens say that Instagram makes them feel worse about themselves. But at the same time, Facebook then also clarified, well, this could have also been written to not the positive effect of Instagram, because it's truth very certain that 30 to 50% actually feel better about themselves after the burning service. So what is it? Is, is, is Instagram good or bad? Well, the technology is not good nor bad. It is socially constructed. Now, nor is it neutral. We talked about that in the previous lecture. So we have to understand what the technology is in order to socially construct a technology that's beneficial for us. And that's what we want to talk today about. And we're going to talk about these persuasive technologies that limit our or or compete with our human free will. And we do that in several steps. We talk about, first of all, the business model of social media, where we spend several hours a day with, and, and what could go wrong with this business model? Maybe an unintended consequence, an unintended side effect. There are certainly no evil intentions uh, here in Northern California and Silicon Valley. I haven't met anybody, but let's understand the business model and see what, what could go wrong there. Then we talk about, so what are the ingredients for that? What well, has to do with artificial intelligence that 
as you know, since the previous lecture has to do with machine learning, and that is fed from data from our past. And it has to do with a goal. And the goal is to predict future behavior. And then we need to see what we know about the resulting algorithmic behavior. And finally, we have to talk about, okay, so how can we socially construct this entire thing? How can we maximize the benefit and reduce and mitigate the risks? We will look at these questions following our framework, the framework of this entire specialization, where we say digital technology and social change co-evolve together. So in the first, in the first course of the specialization, we introduced this framework where we said we have the technology and we have the human, and that is used in order to put different information, communication, and knowledge processes into electronic networks. We digitalize and algorithmify them. And then we have the creative the, the creative part of it, the social constructivism that we have in order to, in order to shape this co-evolution, human choice, hopefully human choice. <laughs> uh, and so, so today we look a little bit deeper. We say like, okay, so what can we do? We can, it's an evolution, we can reduce or we can reinforce change. And we look at one specific application. So just to show you the, the big framework of this entire uh, specialization, we, we focus on this here. And more concretely, we don't focus really on the hardware, we focus on the software, artificial intelligence, big data fed, recommender algorithms, for example, and the human and how they are on social media. And then we see how this software and social media reinforces change that can sometimes go astray. And now so social media algorithms have a good intention, but that can sometimes become too much. Then we can see, well, that reinforces some change in humans, leading, for example, to political polarization leading to misinformation, leading to depression and anxiety and addictions and so forth. And then what we can do, well, how can we tame it a little bit? Negative feedback, how can we reduce change both in the human and in the software? As a first concrete application of this three-dimensional framework that structures our entire course. All right, so let's get going.